Um, today, if it's okay, I'd like to do a little Bible study with you. Um, it's not going to be really a sermon, or, but it's just going to be, I guess, sharing from my heart to yours, something that has been a little bit um, on my heart. Um, I'm a literature evangelist, and as you know, literature evangelists, they deal with what? Hey, man, that's beautiful. They deal with books, right? So uh, we're going to talk about books. I don't know if you know, but there are actually books in heaven. Did you know that? <laughs> I don't know what they look like, if they look like flash drives or, or electronic type, you know. I, but, but we are told that they are called books, right? And, and they can be open. So I'm guessing there's some physical structure to it. And some of this may be a review for some of you, but uh, I want you to stick with me uh, because I believe it's important for us to be reminded and um, to be refreshed on what these books in heaven have to do with us uh, here today. The first book I want to talk about, it's in Philippians chapter 4. So we're going to be flipping pretty quickly because my time is limited. So stay with me. Philippians chapter 4, looking at verse 3. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 3. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. He says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in what? The gospel. the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are where? So here we see that the first book, and I'm privileged to have a copy of, or at least a, a, uh, a sample of it here. I hope that it's a little bit bigger than this in heaven, right? <laughs> But anyways, so the first book we're going to talk about this morning is which book? The book, of life. the book of Life. So Paul says there are people there from the text, contextually, that are in this book. And these are called fellow what? Fellow servants or fellow laborers, right? So it's individuals that are active in the service of God. Would you agree with me? Are these Christian people? These are people that believe in God, right? So here I would call them good Christians. In my opinion, good Christians are not just people that profess the name of Jesus, but in my opinion, good Christians are fellow laborers. I believe if we are Christians, we're called to be missionaries, we're called to be active for Christ, right? Um, in Luke chapter 10, if you can turn there with me, Jesus speaks to the disciples. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, the disciples are really excited, looking at verse 20. They come back to Jesus and they say, Jesus, Jesus, you know, you sent us out without script, without, you know, uh, food and money, and we went and did amazing things, and even the spirits were subjected to us. And, and they're so excited and jumping up and down. And in verse 20, Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus says, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirit are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written where? In heaven. In heaven. In Great Controversy, page uh, 480, it says, The book of life contains the names of all who have ever entered the service of God. So that includes people like Enoch, includes people like Abraham, includes people like Moses, like Daniel, like Peter, like Judas Iscariot. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Was Jesus talking to the disciples? Yes. It's not a trick question. Is Judas a disciple? Yes. Were spirits subjected to Judas? They were. So he's speaking to Judas and he's saying, and, and all the disciples, and says, you know, don't rejoice in that spirits are subjected, but rejoice that your name is in the book of life. Do you have a problem with Judas' name being in the book of life? Did Judas enter the service of God? Yeah, it says the book of life contains the name of all who have ever entered the service of God. Well, if you turn with me to Revelation 21, Revelation 21, uh, thinking about our friend Judas here, who betrayed our master Jesus. Revelation 21, looking at verse 27, speaking about the individuals that will actually enter into heaven, it says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's what? Book of life. So here we see the book of life once again, but here we have a problem. We have a problem because Jesus is saying to Judas that your name 
rejoice, your name is in the book of life, but yet at the same time, according to the Bible, Judas was definitely someone that maketh a lie, that lied and that worked abomination. Would you agree with me? So will Judas be in heaven, yes or no? Are you sure? Oh, so you can have a delete button. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, we have Moses speaking to God. And, um, you know, God is, is, is telling Moses that he wants to destroy the people. And Exodus chapter 32, looking at verse 32. This is Moses pleading with God. He says, yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Which book is that referring to? the book of life. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I do what? Blot out of my books. Definitely. So names can be entered in and names can be removed. So in the book of life, what we have, we don't have individuals that, are, that have never taken the name of Christ upon their lips. In this book, it is only the people that have entered the service of Christ whose names are put in this book. Well, the second book, we're going to turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and hang in there with me. There's a reason why we're going through these books. Malachi chapter 3, and we'll look at verse uh, 16. So in Malachi 3, 16, the Bible says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of what? Remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And so definitely it's something, it's a, it's a good book. It's a book of remembrance. But what are we trying to remember? And I'll just read this one, but it's found in Nehemiah 13, verse 14. It's a prayer from Nehemiah. It says, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. And so the second book that we're talking about this morning is the book of what? Book of Good Deeds. So God actually has, I don't know how it looks like in heaven, but He actually has a second book. And it's, it's I, I don't know how it looks like, but we know that it, it does exist. There is this concept of a book in heaven where good deeds are recorded. In Great Controversy 481, it says, In the book of God's remembrance, every deed of righteousness is immortalized. There, every temptation resisted, Every evil overcome. Every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled. And every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded there. Isn't that amazing? You know, sometimes, especially as when you're honestly seeking to live a Christian life, um, you know, there are times where people recognize what you're doing and they're, you know, encouraging you along the way. But there are times that people have no idea what you're going through. And sometimes you may be wondering, man, is it really worthwhile what I'm doing? Uh, I remember I was talking to a friend of mine one day and he says, John, it's useless. I, I, I give up. <laughs> I mean, I have devotions in the morning and before I even get to breakfast, I mess up. So what's the point? And nobody cares. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be nice, I'm trying to, and, 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 and nobody seems to care, nobody seems to recognize what I'm trying, no, nobody seems to try to help me along the way. But friends, God cares. God knows. God records everything. And so I don't know what your situation is this morning, if you're in a marriage that is struggling, or children, or loved ones that don't appreciate what you're doing. Maybe at work you're being put down because, I don't know, because you're different because you believe in God, that you're a Christian, uh, and you wonder, is it worth it? I'm telling you, whether you're lonely, everything that you endure for Christ's sake is written down. And you know they say payday someday. You know, a friend of mine, he was a literature evangelist with me in Ottawa, and I remember we, he, he, he was very discouraged one day. He sat on the curb. He didn't want to continue knocking on doors. And uh, he says, what's the point? <laughs> What's the point? I mean, I'm going out there and people have just been rejecting me all morning and I, I'm not selling a lot of books. I'm going to go back to school with almost nothing. What's the point? I should probably just go home. 
it seems that nobody cares. The leaders don't care. The other students don't care. But God cares. And you know, he sat down and he opened his little book called Steps to Christ. And he got encouragement. And he got up and he went and he knocked at the next door. And the lady decided to get two books. A book called Great Controversy and another one called God's Answer, which is Bible Readings for the Home. He signed her up for Bible studies and he left. You know, a year later, he came back to Ottawa. We were students again, doing a program there. And prayer meeting, we went to prayer meeting. Uh, we decided, you know, let's just go to prayer meeting this, this Wednesday. There's only about six, seven people there. But while we were about walking out, this lady came and tapped my friend on his shoulder. And she looked around and says, do you remember me? And he looked at her, and of course, he doesn't want to say no. <laughs> So sometimes when people say that, I say, how can I ever forget you? <laughs> but she says, you know, you came to my door, and you sold me a great controversy, and you also sold me a book called God's Answers to Your Question. And she says, you know, I want to tell you that I was baptized just three weeks ago here in this church, and I just want to thank you for coming to my door. Another time we had her testify, and she says, you know, when I met this young man, she says, it felt like heaven, where you'll be able to connect with individuals that were instrumental in bringing you to know Jesus Christ. You know, that was a lesson for all of us, but especially for my friend, because he thought, you know, just when I was about to quit, discouraged, God cares. God writes everything down. And it's true that you may not have a lot of money in the end, but when Christ comes, the reward is sure. The reward is there. Every single thing that you suffer, that you endure for Christ's sake, Somebody cares. Somebody writes it down. And I think that we can all find comfort in that. Well, the book of life, the book of remembrance, is that it? Unfortunately, there's, there's another book, right? Yeah. And that book, I believe, is probably the thickest of all, unfortunately. In Isaiah 65, if you'll turn there with me. Isaiah 65, looking at verse 6. This is God speaking. Isaiah 65, verse 6. God is saying, Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silence. What is written before him? He says, But I will recompense, even recompense, into your, their bosoms. What will he recompense? Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosoms. I want you to notice that that is not speaking to Babylon. This is speaking to God's children, that he's saying, I will recompense. And so that's the third and last book. This doesn't do it justice, but the book of sins. So we have a book of life, book of good deeds, and we have <coughs> book of sins. And I want to read this quote from uh, Great Controversy 482. It says, Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for, unf for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling that is trying to deceive and hide heaven sent warnings or reproofs neglected wasted moments unimproved opportunities the influence exerted for good or for evil with its far-reaching results all are chronicled by the recording angel You know, that last part kind of got me. Because it's not just the wicked that you do that's recorded there. But it's the effect of that wicked deed, of that wicked thought. And how it impacted this one person. And how maybe he could have accepted Christ if... And you know, yesterday we talked about we need a Savior. And when you're faced with a book of sins, you start realizing, I need a Savior. Because when you start realizing we're not that good, 
we're not that holy. You may not be stealing or robbing or robbing or, or, you know, or taking drugs, but, but when you actually stop and think that you look into the book of sins and you start realizing not just the wicked I've done, but all the people that could have been saved if my life had been serious, and all the people that have been lost because I was not there to encourage someone or I discouraged somebody. I remember a friend of mine in college, he said, you know, he was in a stage of rebelling with God, and, and he remember going into his dorm room, and, and one of his friends was reading the Bible, and he started just hashing away at God and telling how God, you know, all this religion is foolishness, and and you know what happened is my friend eventually turned his life around and gave his heart to God. But that young man that he discouraged went out into the world forever. And I don't remember if he died or not. I think he died if I remember correctly. But you know, this man was in tears when he explained to me, <laughs> you know, I would give anything and everything to take back those words that I shared with this young man. But I can't. And you know, many of us, we don't have something so tragic but one day when we will open the book of sins, <laughs> things that we thought was just, you know, whatever, that the angel chronicled everything and the impact and the effect that it had upon our family, upon our friends, upon church members, all the good even that we could have done but didn't do. And now you start feeling a little bit of the guilt. And now we start feeling how much we actually need a Savior. Well, you might be wondering, John, why do you take time to talk to me about books? You may think, well, John, these books are far up in heaven. I'm here in heaven. You know, I have a life to live. I'm, I have work. I have, I have school. I have homework. I have bills to pay. I have family. I mean, I'm busy. I mean, these books are up there, and I'm down here. What, what is the connection with my life? What is connection with my everyday life? What is it? Well, that's the issue, friends. Right now, the books are being opened. In Romans chapter 14, if you can turn there with me. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It says, But why dost thou judge your brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. The interesting thing is that when the judgment is set and the books are open, we're going to be standing before God, but we won't be there physically. I'll still be going to work. I'll still be going to school. I'll still be running around and doing my thing. And my name will come up. And I will stand, not in person, but I will stand. My name will stand as it was. In Great Controversy 483, it says, beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate, which is Jesus, presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned. Every case, notice this, closely investigated. Names are accepted and names are rejected. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life, and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembering. Isn't that interesting? So if my name is in here, and my name comes up, and if my name is rejected, this good deed folder, where is that? That's, that good deed folder for me, my name first of all is removed, and then this book is shredded. Isn't that interesting? Proverbs 28, turn there with me, verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, If anyone has sins that are unrepented of, and therefore, of course, unforgiven, their names are blotted out of the book of life. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, the Bible says, uh, just get there. It says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth shall have mercy. Is that what the Bible says? Whoso confesseth and what? <coughs> Forsakes them shall have mercy. So if we are to have mercy in the day of judgment, we need to just confess, just ask forgiveness. Is that what we need to do? No. 
we ask forgiveness, but God has not only given us forgiveness, God has promised to give us power to turn away from our sins, you know, to confess and to forsake our sins. We are the individuals, if that applies to us, that will have mercy. In Revelation chapter 3, this is the last verse I want to look with you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, this is Jesus talking. Uh, it says, He that overcometh, Revelation 3, verse 5, He that overcometh the, sh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Isn't that wonderful? But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So how does this work, friends? You know, I try to imagine things, to try to make it a little bit more real. I, and, and I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. But according to what I was able to read from the Great Controversy and from the Bible, the concept is that there will come a time where, when a name is read, you know, and so, I don't know, there comes a time when, who's the next person? And so, a name needs to be read. So, who's the next person? Well, it's, it's, it's Anne Smith, let's say, right? And then, uh, well, tell me about her. Well, she was born, let's say, in 1903, and she died in, in um, I don't know, 1968. Well, start talking to me about it, because we are told that when the names are, are every name is mentioned, and every ca case is closely investigated. This is not referring to what the Bible calls the wicked. These are referring to everyone who has actually taken the name, uh, who have ever entered the service of Christ. And so Anne Smith, she was born in 1903, and uh, this is what happened in the first day, second day. I don't know how long it's going to take to go through her, but it seems that it's very closely investigated. And then in 1935, Ann Smith accepted Jesus Christ into her life. Amen, hallelujah. You can see all the angels singing and praising God. And then they keep going, 1936, 1937, January, February, March. Every case is closely investigated. Not one detail needs to be missed out because I'm not there. I'm not there to be able to fight for myself. And so I believe that God is fair and I believe for things to be fair. If the cases or if the court system here in Canada seeks to be just or seeks to be detailed at least, how much more should details be in heaven? But in 1948, on January 25, Ann Smith burned the potatoes. And her husband came in, and he just swore at her, and he called her an idiot. And you know, she had done so many things for him, and uh, that was, I guess, what broke the camel's back, the straw that broke it. And, and she didn't speak much, but she she started to become bitter against him. Well, did she divorce him? No, she didn't divorce him. Uh, was she a good wife? Yeah, she was a good wife. She kept cooking and, and she tried not to burn potatoes. And, and yeah, she, well, was she, was she faithful? Yeah, she was a good Christian woman. She went to church and she, she returned her tithe and, and, and she was awesome. She, actually, she even cooked little cookies for the, for the neighbor kids, you know. She was a really nice woman. Um, but what about that bitterness? And so you see the angels keep flipping, trying to keep going through the life record. And you have Jesus, we are told, that pleads his blood on our behalf. And so Jesus is pleading and saying, no, I died for Ann Smith. Please, Father. And the Father is not the one that wants to strike out Ann Smith. The Father loves Ann Smith just as much as Jesus does, right? Or else he wouldn't have sent Jesus for her. And so Jesus is pleading, and then the Father says, well, that bitterness, I have a few questions. Did, that, did Anne know that I love her? Yes, Father. Did Anne know that I could forgive, I could give her forgiveness for her husband? Yes, Father. Did Anne know that I died to give her power? to bring not only forgiveness in her heart, but to bring healing in her heart also. Did she know that I could change her life? Yes, Father. Well, what happened? And you can hear maybe an angel say, wait, in 1967, one year before she died, 
I'm dramatizing this, okay? But I just, <laughs> just want you to get the concept. One year before she died, you know, she was on a hospital bed, and a husband came in. And, and I, I don't know, maybe she was bitterness, bitter because she knew the husband maybe had been unfaithful. And I mean, you know, sin is complicated. Did you know that? Righteousness is so clean and so straight, but sin complicates things. And I have bitterness because this person did this and because and I. And, but the husband came in that day, January 8, and he wept on her bedside and he asked her forgiveness. And, you know, she forgave him. And she pleaded for forgiveness for us, Father. And uh, and then she died. <laughs> and then uh, the father says, well, keep her book there. Make sure that she comes in. But this is the interesting quote I want to read. It was read yesterday in page 490. It says, the judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon it will pass through the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. Awful presence, but it's still a God that loves us. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. And so I suppose one day, I know one day my name will be called up. And an angel will thunder out, Jonathan Zeta. And I'll be just walking around, playing with my kids, and having a good old time, and going out and knocking on doors and trying to help people. Have no idea. But the angel will call my name, Jonathan Zeta. And the book will be open for my name. Jonathan Zeta, born September 14, 19, so and so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what happened? Well, this is what happened day one, day two, day three, year one, year two, year three. And, and when he was five years old, he called his sister an idiot. And when he was six years old, he refused to wash the dishes. And when he was eight years old, well, that's off one. And it goes on and on and on. But wait, Father. In 1997, in a room downstairs in this specific address, Jonathan knelt down at this time. And with tears in his eyes, he gave his life to you. And that's why his name is in this book. Well, that's wonderful. And so what happened after? Well, after he went and started studying, you know, to be a missionary. And then after that, he started to, to, to go out and do literature evangelism. And, 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 and then in January 8, uh, on, uh, 2005, this is what happened. And by the way, this is Jane Smith. She's here in heaven because of the, that, that book. And, 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 and in January 8, this is what happened. And, and, and John Brown is here because in heaven because he was able to reach her. And, and so it goes through down through my life, step by step, all the good things I have done, praise the Lord, and all the wicked things I have done also. But then in September 2006, September 8, he got upset with his brother because his brother did so and so to him, and so he got really angry. And he cussed at him and he swore and he just wanted him completely out of his life because his brother, let's say, offended his wife. And so talk to me, says God. And so you keep going through Jonathan Zeta's life. And friends, there will come a time when they will have to stop looking at the book because the letters will stop being written and they will have to start looking down on earth because there'll be no more in the book I'm still alive and they will look down and they will see well what is Jonathan doing right now well right now Jonathan is at ECYC and he's preaching a sermon upon upon what we're doing right now <laughs> that's beautiful but what about that brother what happened well but father my blood <laughs> father you know did he ask for forgiveness? No, Father, but, but look, he went to church, and he returned his tithe faithfully. 
and you know, he treated his children well, but did he ask for forgiveness? No father, but you know, he really loved his wife a lot and he bought her flowers on anniversary and even when he didn't have to buy her flowers, he still bought her and, and he donated much time and money and you know, father, he's in the ministry and you know, father, that he, these people are in heaven because of him and you know. Son, did he know that I loved him so much that I gave you that he didn't have to hold a grudge. Yes, Father. Did he know that I can not only give him power to change, but I can even give him a desire to change? Yes, Father. Did he know that I had given the gift of the Holy Spirit to change his life so that he can ask forgiveness and be a new man? Yes, Father. But Father, my blood, my blood, please, Father, my blood. And friends, I think God has a heart just like we do because we're made in His image. And I think it's going to tear the Father's heart just as much as it will tear Christ's heart. But if there's something in my life that I haven't given up, I'm not perfect, but if I haven't claimed the righteousness of Christ, if I had hold on to bitterness, hold on to grudge, <coughs> hold on to certain things or secret sins and justify myself saying, you know, I can't change because of this and that. You know, Jesus can stand before his father and he can cry and he can weep and he can have tears streaming down and he can show the hands, he can show the side, he can show the feet. And the father also can be weeping like crazy. But I won't go in, friends. And you know, the reason this topic, I guess, is important is because as Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to preach the three angels' message. The first message is fear God and give glory to Him. Why? Because the hour of His judgment is come. This is what it's all about. I know I probably didn't portray it, obviously, as it's happening in heaven, but I hope that you understand the principles that I've shared. The principles is this that we're not preparing people to die in Christ. We're preparing people to live before God when their name is called up. It's a difference. There's a difference. And one day the books will be open for the living. And then your name will be called up. And one day the Father and the whole court of the universe will have to stop at the last page and close the book and start looking down at your life and start thinking and seeing who is this person? What is this person doing right now? We want revival. We want reformation in our lives. And that's amazing. And God will give it to us. However, I think we need to understand that there are certain things in our <coughs> lives that even God Almighty cannot overlook. Are you with me? The judgment is for us. It's not against us. Why? Because God has had so much compassion. He's given us Jesus Christ. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's, God is for us, not against us. The judgment is for us. It's not against us. But with all the knowledge that we know, if we still decide, I'm going to hold on to certain sins, I'm going to hold on to bitterness and grudge, I'm going to hold on to certain things that I know is not because of pride, because of genes, because of whatever, Christ can weep all He wants, but there's nothing that He'll be able to do for you. And friends, wouldn't it be sad that you young people who are excited for Jesus, that are doing stuff for Him, wouldn't it be sad that there are actually people in heaven that are running <laughs> up and down the streets and looking for you and can't find you because you never made it?